The church, I don't need to tell you this, but you need to be reminded, we all do, the church is a family. Let brotherly and sisterly, because Paul would have, or the writer of Hebrews would, have, would certainly have included the women here, let family in the church, let that love continue. This sounds like a trite sort of, well, we know that, let's get on to something else. No, no, that's a very simple, profound statement. My sense is that there's a lot of non-brotherliness, non-sisterliness in the church today. I watched the email interchanges between people sometime, and they're pretty hideously awful. If we are not demonstrating collegiality, brotherly and sisterly love in our communication with each other, we are not measuring up to this little statement. So there it is in verse one, that brotherly and sisterly love Arapi, that famous Greek word Arapi, and you can learn Greek with us if you're interested in that. We're doing that on a Wednesday. Uh, Carlos can mention that later, but perhaps. But that wonderful Greek word Arapi, love, means the divine love working through the Spirit in us. That must continue, and it must increase. As two, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers foreigners even, people who you don't particularly know, but you can give them hospitality, give them a meal, a place to stay, because in doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Those of you who know your Old Testament well will, will think immediately of Genesis 8, where three men showed up in Genesis 18. Sorry, did I say 8? I mean 18. Genesis 18, three men showed up. Two of them were angels, and one is actually addressed as God, Adonai, the Lord God. One of the three is addressed as God himself, probably a representative of God, but they appeared as angels. And Abraham did very well, and Sarah with him, in preparing a meal for them. So they actually entertained at least two angels there, and the third one was a super angel, if you like, actually addressed as God, Adonai, in Genesis 18. Now look at this. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them. This is very unreal to our present life. And so we have to make our imaginations work hard to see what this really entails. How many of your Christian friends here in America are in prison for being Christians? Probably none. We live in an extraordinary time of freedom of speech. We have this famous amendment in the Constitution, which now enables us, theoretically at least, to say what we want to say without being censored, although you're seeing some negative influence even on that great principle in our times. But remember those fellow brothers and sisters in who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Wow, that's rather remote. No good just reading over these words and we'll say, well, that sounds good, that sounds pious, that sounds biblical and spiritual. Ponder what's being said there. Remember those people, those Christian brothers and sisters who are actually in prison for their faith, as though you were likewise in prison with them. And those who are ill-treated, as though you are suffering with them. Reminds me always of Acts 14.22, which says, through much tribulation, we are destined to enter the kingdom. The language about going to heaven is thoroughly misleading. Even this last week, I heard somebody say of some of our enemies in the Middle East that the president wanted them not to live anymore on the earth. What? In other words, the president wanted them to go to heaven? or didn't want them to go to heaven, whatever it was. But the language is wrong. Don't talk about going to heaven when you die. That is the wrong goal. The goal is always to enter the kingdom when Jesus comes back. The promise to Abraham and his seed is that he would be heir of the world, not go to heaven when he dies and play a harp on a cloud in sky. That's thoroughly misleading. Don't use that sort of language. So there you have it. Those who are being ill-treated, imagine that you are being ill-treated with them. Through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom. I recommend you learn by heart the eight kingdom of God verses in Acts. That will reattach 
Paul's writings to Jesus. The devil only has one major trick, and that trick is to separate Jesus from his own teachings. Jesus is the first rabbi, teacher, instructor. His gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus, I repeat, I have to say this because this information is not clear to many churchgoers. The kingdom of God, Jesus, was the first preacher of his own gospel. Have you got that? His own gospel of the kingdom. If you don't talk about the kingdom of God, you don't sound like Jesus. If you talk about going to heaven when you die, you don't sound like Jesus. That's very dangerous for your own spiritual health. So imagine being ill-treated. And if you are ill-treated, even by your own family, that's part and par for the course, as we say. It is in the nature of Christianity to be opposed by your own family. And he who loves mother and father, wife, husband, brother and sister more than he loves Jesus is not fit for the kingdom. What? That's pretty challenging. So then he doubles down, as they say, on this concept of Christian living, Christian behavior. Look at it in verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. That is a, a teaching against enforced celibacy. There is a large church that you're all aware of, which says that the clergy must not be married. That is condemned by that verse, by the way. That enforced celibacy, that leaders, male leaders in the church must not be married is absolutely false to scripture. It's a complete lie. So this writer to the Hebrews says, let marriage be honored that is proper marriage marriage held in honor among all of us and that means the marriage of a man and a woman all this incredible language i say incredible because it's really an amazing abuse of simple logic and language the idea that you can decide on your preferred gender is a sign of terrible degeneracy and chaos in the human race at the present time. So let marriage be honored and held in honor by all and the marriage bed to be undefiled. There, of course, he has a strong teaching against any kind of sexual activity occurring before marriage or with somebody other than your wife or husband after marriage. These are very strong condemnations and there's no rim, room at all for exceptions there. People, as it says in many other passages in the New Testament, people who commit fornication, that's to say they are having sexual activity before marriage, or they're being sexually united to people other than their husband and wife, will not enter the kingdom. They won't be saved. Is that clear? They will not be saved because God expects the obedience of faith. Hebrews 5, 9 marvelous verse, the obedience of faith from all of us. So that looks like an innocent statement about marriage, but it's profoundly applicable to our present chaotic standards of conduct. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge, and he'll judge them adversely. He'll say, get out of here. I will not accept you in my kingdom because you did not obey the basic law of sexual activity that it belongs within lawful marriage, the marriage of a man to a woman. So there's a mass of important teaching right there. Okay, let me get to verse five. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Now, money in itself is not wrong. In fact, there's a text in the in the words of Jesus which says that if you are a true Christian, it may be your lot, it may be your destiny to have lands, brothers and sisters, and property and so on. If God wills that and he thinks you're fit to have it, there's nothing wrong with having lands. There's nothing wrong with being rich financially provided you are generous with that money. And so you'll find in the book of Timothy that Paul told the wealthy to be generous. He didn't tell them to give up all the money and be impoverished. 
Some people are poor, some are richer, but that handling of money is the standard by which you will be judged. So then you have uh, in verse six, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. And before that, God had just said, I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. I will never abandon you. Isn't that marvelous? Think about those simple statements. God is a God of such character, such determination, such consistency, that he will never abandon his beloved children. So we, in response in verse 6, can confidently say, Yahweh, the Lord God, or the Lord Jesus, because he reflects God. He's not God, of course. Jesus is not God, but he's the son and agent of God. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can people do to me? The worst they can do to you is to kill you. But so what? The resurrection is always there. The next moment after you're killed, if that should be your lot, the next second of your consciousness, you'll be resurrected. That's to say you will have undergone the sleep of death. And you show your friends Daniel 12 verse 2 all the time. Many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground. Carlos had the one in Isaiah 26 on the screen just recently. The very next second of your consciousness, you'll be in that future resurrection. So the future resurrection, the resurrection of the just, as Luke 14, 14 calls it, is your ultimate objective. That's your ultimate hope. God cannot leave you, will not abandon you, and he will raise you from the dead at the return, the parousia, the second coming, the arrival of Jesus Christ. So we're to imitate the faith of our leaders. That's interesting. Verse 7, our leaders. In Scripture, the leaders were normally a multitude, a multiple number of pastors, elders, overseers. They are roughly the same idea. Remember your leaders who spoke the gospel word of God. That's my translation. Spoke the word of God. The word in the Bible, I want to repeat this. The word of God doesn't just mean the Bible. It means the gospel namely the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. People don't know that. The word is not vaguely the Bible. That's the words of God, certainly. We believe the Bible to be the inspired words of God. But that gospel word, logos, is a technical term for the gospel of the kingdom. Always refer to Matthew 13, 19, where the word is called the word about the kingdom of God. So remember those people who introduced you the saving gospel about the kingdom of God, how to be heir of the world and to gain immortality, and consider the outcome of their way of life. Watch their way of life, watch their style, and imitate their faith. Interesting. So we have models of faith in our own time. People have been there before, they're older than we are perhaps, and they've modeled this faith in the gospel of the kingdom. Remembering that Jesus, in verse 8, Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ. In my translation, I rendered the word Christ as Messiah. That gives it its proper Jewish flavor. Messiah is a title. It means the king of the world, the son of David, who is going to rule the world successfully. The first person ever to successfully make the nations beat their swords into plowshares and so on. That is going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the extreme limits of the whole salvation program. Now then, he warns with a warning that is very much applicable to today's religious scene. Verse 9, do not be carried away. Don't be led off by different and strange, odd teachings. For it is God, it is good that your heart, yourself, be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial food, which did not benefit those who did so. There's a tendency for human beings to invent their own religion. There are some who are thinking, well, the food laws given in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, they surely must be binding on us. And the answer is they're not. 
So you will refer your friends, I hope, to Colossians 2, 16, 17. Don't let anybody tell you what to do in relation to food and drink and Sabbath, holy days and new moons. The Jewish calendar, enforced certainly under the Old Covenant, is not binding on you today. I repeat, not. There is no value at all in your keeping the Sabbath on Saturday or trying to keep the holy days. And if you do them, you should be doing new moons as well. None of that is applicable to the new covenant. And that's what our writer is getting at here. So we want your heart, says our Hebrews writer, be strengthened by grace, not by eating this food, not eating that food. If you want to have pork, you can have pork. None of this benefits those who are tempted to be more righteous than Jesus, more righteous than the new covenant. Verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle, that was the tent in which God walked around under Old Testament conditions, they have no right to eat. Much of the book of Hebrews is an attempt to get you clear that the new covenant is not the same as the old covenant. There was of necessity, Hebrews has told us, there would be a change in the law when the new covenant was introduced. The new, which is the renewed and the new covenant. Both Greek words apply there, new and renewed. It's a brand new covenant and it doesn't follow the laws of the old covenant. So much so that the Levitical priesthood, and only Levites had a right to be priests, as you know, that Levitical priesthood has now been completely annulled, changed, altered, done away with by the supremely final Melchizedek priesthood. That Melchizedek was a shadowy figure. We don't have any record of his mother and father. As the Hebrew writer told us, he sort of comes in out of the distance. We don't know exactly the detail of him. But Jesus is a priest according to the Melchizedek system. Jesus, I remind you, is a Jew. Jesus had no right to the Levitical priesthood. Verse 12, actually we'll do verse 11 for that. The bodies are, did not benefit those who did so, if they get into food. We have an altar. That's the Christian altar. The whole new covenant system with its own altar some commentators think the altar is really Jesus himself. It's the whole system of the new covenant, the place of worship where you find God under the new covenant. Those who serve the tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle in which God traveled around, they have no right to eat there. Jewish people who do not believe in the Messiah have no right to eat at the Christian altar all the things of Messiah. A Jew believes in the one God, but he has not accepted that Jesus has come, mostly because they say, well, Jesus is not ruling the world and the Messiah is supposed to rule the world. That's correct. He is supposed to rule the world. He hasn't yet begun to do that on a worldwide scale. So both Jews and Muslims have failed to recognize Jesus as Messiah, and they have no right then to eat at the Christian altar. Verse 11, the bodies of those animals whose blood the Old Testament priest, the high priest, brings into the holy place as an offering for sin, those bodies of animals are burned outside the camp. That's certainly true of the Old Testament system. Therefore, in verse 12, Jesus also as the antitype, that's to say the corresponding to that Old Testament type. A type is an impression, a forerunning idea, something that points you forward to something greater than itself. And that's Jesus. So Anthony, that he would you make, could yeah. put the mic over your mouth. Please. Yeah, is that better? Yep. Therefore, Jesus also so that he would make the people holy by his own blood. A brand new idea. No more animal sacrifices. No more insistence on food laws. No more insistence on Sabbath, holy days, and new moons, but rather Jesus bore our sins. He took our sins on himself. He died in our place, Mark 10 says that, as a substitution for us. We would be dead, but Jesus very nobly and generously went on that cross, 
although he was not pleased to do that in himself. Remember that Jesus was tempted in every point as we are, and yet without sin. So he went on the cross. He said, Father, if it could be your will, spare me this agony. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He knew that in God's plan, he had to suffer the ultimate torture of being killed on a cross. So we have that exactly in verse 14. We do not here, under the present conditions, have a lasting city. So uh, Los Angeles, Portland, London are not the city to which you are looking forward. What you're looking forward to is the city to come, which is the future Jerusalem that in the book of Revelation is said to come down, that's to say, to come and have its origin from heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. All right, through him, through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. A lot of this writing is typological. In other words, the Old Testament pattern points forward. It's an impression as, for instance, the face of the emperor on a coin is impressed on that coin. It's an impression. So you have typology here, sacrifices which were very abundant, you know, different sorts of animal sacrifices, bulls and goats and lambs and so on. All of those are now done away with, are replaced by a sacrifice of praise to God. So a significant part of our prayer life, our devotional life should be praise to God. If you're the God of creation, you certainly deserve to be praised. Psalm 51, 17 the sacrifice of a broken spirit. Broken in the sense that it's been made available to God. Your whole spirit, your whole personality is sacrificed, offered as a sacrifice to God. A broken spirit, that's a sacrifice according to that Psalm 51, 17. So thanksgiving is a major part of prayer, I get it. There is a hierarchy in the New Testament which we as evangelicals as uh, Protestants tend to, sh to, to be afraid of, obey your leaders, submit to them, because they're keeping watch over you. Th that assumes, of course, that the leaders are good leaders. They are watching over you. They'll have to give an account for how well they've done that. So don't let too many people be teachers, James said. On the other hand, he says, some of you should be teachers for the time that you've been Christians. You ought to be teachers. So you apply that to yourself in whatever way it suits your particular conditions. They're going to have to give account of their leadership. Let them, your leaders, do this with joy, not with grief. Because that wouldn't be good for you. You don't want your leaders have to, to look after you with grief. So be good followers if that's your status. But don't forget that your chief pastor is Jesus, who has been raised from the dead. And then verse 18, pray for us. We're sure that we have a good conscience. Every Christian, teacher or otherwise, should have a clear conscience. That's what baptism, according to Peter, grants us. When you get baptized in water, which is a non-negotiable part of the Christian faith, then you have an open, good conscience. You're before God, you're in good conscience, not guilty, and desire to conduct ourselves honorably. He's speaking for himself there. Whoever wrote this book of Hebrews, we desire to behave ourselves, our Christian walk, our Christian lives should be honorable in every possible respect. I urge you to pray. I, the writer, whoever it was, could be restored to you very soon. Does that mean that he was in prison? I'm not sure that that's true, but be restored to you. He'd been taken away from them very soon. Okay, verse 20. He ends with a, what we call a doxology, a sort of greeting or praise to God at the end, as is typical in letters, but I've been telling you that this is not really so much a letter, the whole book, more of a homily or a huge sermon. May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead, who resurrected the great shepherd, pastor of the sheep, our Lord Jesus, in the blood of the covenant. Oh, this is wonderful. The blood 
That's to say the death, which is a substitutionary death for our sins, of the covenant of the age to come. I translated that eternal covenant, I think correctly, covenant related to the age to come, the future age of the kingdom. That's the promise to Abraham that he would be heir of the world in the age to come, the future kingdom. The blood ratifies, brings into force the covenant. So I cannot pass that verse without referring you to Luke 22, 29, where Jesus at the Lord's Supper said, I covenant to give you the kingdom. That's what the Greek says there. I covenant. The whole point of the new covenant is the gift of the kingdom of God to be shared among the believers. Jesus is going to be the chief ruler and he's going to share that covenant of the kingdom to come, the age to come, with his followers. He wants God, this writer, to equip us with every good thing to do his will. Many of you are well equipped. You're studying your Bibles. You're reflecting on these things. You're involved in teaching, teaching children, teaching other people. You're working as this writer wants us to do what is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Messiah, here's the doxology part of it. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I urge you in verse 22, brothers and sisters. I, this is, makes me smile when I read this, to bear with my word of exhortation. This is a little sermon exhorting you. I've written to you briefly. What? Briefly. This is a massive piece. It's really challenged me very much studying for these sessions. I've urged you in a few brief words. I've exhorted you. Exhortation. Keep up the good work. How shall we escape if we neglect this incredible salvation, Hebrews 2, 3. Then finally, a domestic note, our brother Timothy has been freed from prison. We're back to the idea of Christians suffering literally by being taken to prison. And with him, if he comes soon, I'm going to be seeing you. This is a rather charming, brotherly, collegial and we lack that among ourselves often in our email exchanges. We need to do much better. I will see you with Timothy. Finally, greet all of your leaders. So the leaders then are given a hierarchical position distinct from all the saints. The saints would be all of the true believers. Those from Italy send their greetings. Isn't that nice? Isn't that personable? Isn't that collegial? Finally, grace which is God's gracious kindness to us, be with all of you.